by taking advantage of a new chemistry recently made commercially available, our speaker will discuss how extensive iteration and optimization has yielded a fully compatible method with a broad set of use cases for single cell profiling. Without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker to you now. Ms. Abe is a PhD student in the biological and biomedical science program at Harvard University. She received her bachelor's in biochemistry from Rowan University, Glasgow, New Jersey, New Jersey, and subsequently joined Twist Biosciences, headquartered in South San Francisco, California, working on developing assays for the gene assembly pipeline. More recently, Ms. Abe worked in Ansuman Satpathy's lab, Stanford University School of Medicine, Stanford, California, where she was developing tools for profiling rare cell types. Welcome, Ms. Abe, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Jackie. I'm gonna share my screen now. Are you um, able to, to see my screen? Yes, yes, I am. Perfect, okay. Um, so like Jackie said, my name is Sion and today I'll be talking to you guys about a method that we've developed. Um, and I'll be starting with some of the optimization that we did and some of the um, initial uh, motivation for the work. Um, and I'll follow that with some of the um, biological settings that we've utilized this technology in. Um, and I wanna open the table up for questions as well because we're very um, excited about people trying out this method. Cool, so I'm gonna start with um, what really motivated this work initially when I first joined Ansu's lab. Um, and single cell has really been, single cell RNA sequencing has really been a very powerful technology um, in allowing for deconvolving very heterogeneous cell and tissue populations um, by barcoding individual cell populations and preparing uh, libraries and looking at the gene expression profiles of different cell types. Um, there is one discovery that I really wanna call out here that came out of um, Ansu's lab when I joined, and there were a few um, single cell discoveries that were occurring, but this is one that I believe was more clinically relevant um, or more directly clin clinically relevant. Um, and it was the discovery of these rare human herpes virus 6 reactivating um, CAR T cells. Um, and it was also observed broadly in T cell cultures, but specifically in autologous um, cell therapies. Um, and these cells reactivate very early on um, and result in overall spread of the virus um, in the culture. Um, to, to oversimplify CAR Ts, um, patients, uh, cancer patients specifically, um, these are FDA-approved pro uh, products and cancer patients that cancer patients receive. Um, and the idea is that you can take out T cells from the patients um, and and give and culture it um, culture it um, ex vivo, um, and then these cells are uh, then engineered with with CARs, which stand for chimeric antigen receptors. Um, and then during this ex vivo culturing is when this HHV6 reactivation was observed. Um, HHV6 is a virus that is endemic in, the, in um, different human populations. Um, and upon um, reinfusion of this product into patients, there were also reportings of encephalitis associated with HHV6 um, positive tests. And so what, what we found was that this early reactivation could be causing um, the reactivation that was being observed or could be contributing to this reactivation that was being observed in patients receiving these therapies. Another more well-known discovery was these ionocyte populations in uh, the lung airway epithelium um, in both human and mice. Um, and these populations are also quite rare. Um, and what makes them really interesting is that they express most of the CFTR gene um, in these regions. Um, and so this is important because mutations in CFTR are implicated in cystic fibrosis disease. And so there's a lot of interest in understanding these populations further. Something that both of these discoveries have in common is that um, they're, they're quite rare populations that are um, seen by uh, very unique transcriptional markers. Um, and uh, they're also um, not amenable to profiling with or amenable to enrichment with uh, protein-based um, enrichment methods that are more broadly used. Um, and so you have to profile millions of cells to be able to make any meaningful inferences about these um, rare cell types. Um, and so a question that we were really interested in is whether there was a better way of studying these rare cells um, to further understand their heterogeneity and make any functional inferences. 
um, beyond their, their discoveries. So there were a few capabilities that we had in mind when, when designing this assay. Um, and one of the first ones was the ability to enrich based off of an arbitrary RNA marker. Um, and so we wanted to be able to enrich based off RNA markers that we were seeing in our single cell RNA sequencing um, data um, and look at these subpopulations in a very specific way. And current standard uh, capabilities uh, that are protein-based allow you to do this. So we wanted to be able to match that. Uh, another thing that we wanted to be able to do is um, enrich based, in a pro based off of a programmable way. So being able to do um, either end or or not gate strategies where we use multiple markers um, to enrich for a specific cell population of interest. Um, and, and in some scenarios also uh, being able to gate on either the presence or absence of, of uh, a specific RNA marker. Another capability that we were very interested in is having compatibility with different uh, tissue and cell types. Um, and so like I mentioned earlier, we have T cells that are cell suspensions, but we also want to be able to do it on um, tissue samples um, that could be fresh, frozen, or even formalin fixed, um, and really like broaden the capabilities. Uh, we also didn't want to lose on our cell quality. So we wanted to get high quality per cell measurements um, that would um, allow us to, to look at multiple genes and detect multiple genes um, on a per cell basis. And finally, uh, we also want to be able to make high throughput measurements that would allow us to look at heterogeneity and make any functional inferences about these cell populations that we were interested in. Um, so the method is called PERFSEQ, stands for Programmable Enrichment via RNA Flowfish by Sequencing. Um, this was uh, work that really took off because of the mentorship that I got from uh, people in Ansu Sathpathy's lab. Um, and these are Bob and Caleb. Um, Caleb also went on to start his own lab um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, and uh, this work was really elevated with collaboration with the Single Cell Analytics Innovation Lab at MSK um, and worked with Merrill and Ronan to, to really elevate it and, and brought in the, the different capabilities that we could have. So getting into some key aspects of this assay, um, I want to start with this RNA fish technology that has been innovated by molecular instruments. Um, it's a commercially available kit. Um, and so the idea is that you have, um, you can design probes for an RNA target of interest. Um, and these probes bind and tile your RNA target. Um, and upon binding of probe sets adjacent to one another, um, they make up a full initiator sequence. And then upon introduction of an amplifier with a user-defined fluorophore, um, these, these metastable hairpins can uh, detect this initiator sequence uh, and bind, and this um, triggers a tethered amplification reaction that results in very high um, signal generation. And so this really allows us to, to get very specific signal that we can uh, further enrich for our populations of interest in facts-based assorted sorting methods. Um, a key limitation for, for our applications um, is that this requires a formaldehyde cross-linking step. Um, so this is a method that is very broadly used in the imaging space in many different tissue and cell contexts, but uh, there is a formaldehyde fixation followed by a permeabilization to make the RNA accessible for uh, the probe binding and signal generation. Um, and, and the issue with formaldehyde cross-linking is that it degrades um, RNA, and it's, it's been known to degrade RNA, and most traditional single-cell RNA sequencing kits uh, rely on a reverse transcription method, um, and so you can't reliably amplify um, your RNA target um, based, based on these methods. Um, and then a key second technology that really elevated this was the new kit from 10X Genomics. Um, and Tanks Genomics has really been a leader in the development of single cell assays that have really broadened our capabilities um, in, in biology. Um, but this new kit uh, offers an entirely new chemistry that really, um, that I really want to get into because it is new and um, I'm going to spend some time talking a little bit about it. So the idea is that you um, first actually fix and permeabilize your cells and then you, hi you hybridize a full transcriptome probe set um, that binds your mRNA target. So upon binding of, of these probe sets adjacent to one another, um, the gel bead is introduced 
and a ligation step is performed to ligate the left-hand side and the right-hand side probe to one another. Um, this will be important in later slides. Um, and uh, using the probe capture sequence handle uh, homology, your single cell um, your single cell gems are generated, um, and your your library preparation occurs, uh, like most um, conventional single cell methods. Um, and so what this really allows us to do is that it's compatible with fixation. Um, it uses a similar approach uh, to uh, the upstream method that we are interested in. And so we wanted to combine these two methods to be able to enrich for our specific populations based on unique transcriptional markers that we're seeing in single cell um, and do downstream profiling of these specific populations. So our first attempts at this assay um, were not great. Uh, so the, the one I'm showing in red is just normal flex on peripheral blood mononuclear cells, uh, which I'll be calling PBMCs moving forward. Um, and you can see that there's a higher per cell quality compared to uh, doing flow fish upstream, like enriching for our cell populations upstream and doing flex. Um, interestingly, we also observed that in our um, flow fish flex libraries, most of our reads were mapping to half of the probe set. Uh, versus the normal flex, where you see majority of the reads mapping to confidently mapped full probe sets. And so we were interested in further understanding this, and we looked back to our bioanalyzer traces and looked at the two prominent peaks that we have in our traces. So the 260 base pair peak highlighted in blue is a complete product with both the right hand and left hand side probes and handles required for sequencing and unique molecular identifiers for individual cells. Um, however, we were seeing this 190 base pair peak, and we were interested in, in understanding this further. Um, and, and we found that um, in the absence of ligation occurring between the left-hand side and the right-hand side probe, there can be a free probe extension on the bead oligo if there is homology between those regions. And so this results in a sequenceable truncated product that we see here, and is likely causing this uh, half-mapped probe set that we were seeing in our sequencing data. Um, but we also found that this was a good metric to measure our assay performance uh, moving forward. And so uh, one of the first things we wanted to do was basically identify what was causing this um, inhibition of probe ligation. Um, and so to do this, we looked at different aspects of our upstream method or enrichment method that we were using. Um, and we, we started with uh, dextran sulfate. So dextran sulfate is a compound that is used um, extensively in the HCR fish assays, um, and it's used to reduce um, background signal that's generated by um, non-specific binding of probes and or hairpins. Um, however, dextran sulfate has also been known to inhibit enzymatic reactions, um, which are important in our downstream approaches. And so we, we reason that this could be causing the ligation efficiency issues that we were seeing in our 10x flex libraries. Second, uh, we were interested in looking at this large HCR hairpin polymer that forms um, and, and wondered whether this was also causing some of the inhibition that we were observing in, in our probe binding um, and ligation. Uh, finally, we were also curious to see if these hairpins alone were able to um, inhibit any binding of, of 10x uh, probes and ligation efficiency. Um, so interestingly, dextran sulfate um, did not positively uh, impact our assay performance, uh, both in its presence and its absence. Um, you can see that most of the, the reads map to uh, half of the probe set, uh, whether we have dextran sulfate or not. Uh, the second thing we looked at was the HCR polymer. Um, and interestingly, um, when, when cells were taken through the FlowFish protocol, um, in the absence of probe and hairpins, uh, we saw that we could generate a successful library similar to um, just doing normal flex. Um, and so that was, uh, that we found was like the main causative agent. Um, finally, adding hairpin alone did not inhibit any enzymatic reaction downstream. And so taking inspiration from the imaging field, we wanted to um, basically remove this HCR polymer. However, this polymer is very important to us because it allows us to um, sort based off of um, the presence or absence of uh, fluorescent signal. Um, however, it was causing issues downstream in library generation of 10x flex. 
And so we wanted to remove this polymer after sorting for our cell populations of interest, but before doing 10x flex um, downstream. And so we took inspiration from the imaging field and used um, two approaches. These are used for um, in imaging for iterative um, fish methods where um, you don't have a lot of channels to, to um, image multiple RNA molecules. Um, and so the first approach was a formamide-based approach where you use a very high concentration of formamide to um, completely strip um, this HCR polymer. And we interestingly found that um, using this method, um, regardless of the presence of HCR polymer, uh, resulted in most of our reads mapping to half of the probe sets and our ligation efficiency being um, very low. And so we moved away from this approach and we thought about an enzymatic approach. Um, and here we use um, DNAs. Uh, we use two different types of DNAs, one that is a total DNAs and strips both double-stranded and single-stranded um, DNA. Um, and the second approach was uh, specific to just double-stranded DNAs. Um, and we found that both worked well with the downstream 10x flex assay with most of our reads confidently mapping to our full uh, complete product with both the left-hand side and the right-hand side probes. So this was very exciting. Um, but we did choose to move forward with the double-stranded DNAs because we wanted to do multi-omic approaches that would allow us to, um, to use single-stranded um, DNA downstream without any issues. Uh, finally, we found that um, sorting was a very important aspect as well. Um, previously, FBS has been used um, in flow fish methods to sort cell populations of interest, but we found high levels of RNA degradation uh, in the inclusion of FBS, and we opted to use BSA, uh, molecular grade BSA instead, and, and that resulted in, in very good library quality um, based on this ligation efficiency that I'm showing. Cool. So just to bring us all back together, um, an overview of what PerfSeq is. Um, and so the first step of this is really the HCR fish technology for molecular instruments, where you can design uh, probes for any mRNA target um, across the tree of life. Um, and you can then include um, hairpin molecules that allow you to amplify this fluorescent signal um, and, and sort uh, for the absence or uh, presence of a specific fluorescent signal um, in, a, in a way where that can be multiplexed. Um, you then do a double-stranded DNA's digestion where you remove the HCR polymer. And then this is followed by inclusion of the flex whole transcriptome probe set and uh, performing fixed cell, single cell RNA sequencing or the flex assay as I've been calling it. Cool, so once we, we had a working assay, one of the first things we did was benchmark to see um, how good our enrichment actually was. Um, and so here I'm showing four libraries. One is just normal flex. The second is samples that have been taken through the FlowFish protocol upstream uh, without the inclusion of probes and without sorting. The third is um, the inclusion of, of a, a specific probe, but without sorting for a specific cell population. And finally, we do our full PerfSeq workflow where we include um, probes for um, CD3E, and then we sort for our cell populations of interest. And CD3E is a, is a very specific marker for T cells. And so that is what we are expecting to see in these PBMC populations. Um, so here I'm showing a, a plot, a fax plot, where you can see the CD3E flowfish um, signal separation. And so we gated based off of this. And very excitingly, we found that most of our cells, or majority of our cells, up to 97% of our cells were um, T cells uh, using different annotation methods. And so this was very exciting as we saw that uh, PerfSeq was very specific um, in enriching for cell populations that um, we were interested in. Um, and then we also found that there was no appreciable loss in data quality. Um, when downsizing to the same amount of reads, we find that PerfSeq was comparable to public PBMC data sets uh, to flex to our, and then to our internal control data sets as well. So there's a few different approaches that uh, we took in utilizing this assay in different biological contexts. Uh, one of the first is identifying cells with uh, variable TF expressions. Um, so this is traditionally done with, um, with protein markers, but we opted to enrich for the RNAs of transcription factors. 
Um, and we found that we were able to very specifically enrich for BCL11A, which is a marker of B cell um, lymphoid development and SPI1. Um, and we interestingly saw that decoupling the protein uh, from the RNA expression resulted in enrichment of uh, specific cell populations that uh, we were initially not expecting to see. Uh, next, we also enrich based off of both coding and non-coding RNA. So I think this is a very exciting approach that can be taken with um, PerfSeq because you cannot um, enrich based off of a protein marker by design because you have a non-coding RNA. Um, but with PerfSeq, you can design probes that you're interested in uh, for RNAs that you're interested in, enrich for those and do downstream flex profiling. Um, and here we show Exist, which is a long non-coding RNA that's been implicated in X inactivation. Um, and we show that it is very specific and sensitive to, um, to that uh, RNA. We also show, which was our initial motivation for this work, rare cell type enrichment and um, ability to, to study these cell types. Um, here I'm showing a plot of um, ASTCs, which are the rarest forms of PBMCs. Um, and we find that when enriching based off of um, SPI1 and BCL11A, that these cell types can be um, enriched. And we find further heterogeneity um, that has been previously described, but we nominate new markers that we believe will be important in the study of these cell populations further. Finally, uh, we also show that this, this method can be extended to um, tissue settings. And uh, we showed that this can be extended to frozen um, tissue settings and formalin fixed paraffin embedded samples as well. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit more about these um, tables that I've highlighted in red. Um, and I'm first going to start by um, describing another rare cell approach that we took. And this is attempting to resolve mosaic loss of Y in PBMC population. So loss of Y is um, one of the most um, age-related um, mosaic um, genetic uh, the, uh, losses that have been observed. Um, and this is an accumulation of losing the Y chromosome or expression um, uh, in this setting. And um, this is work that was done by my co-first author, Meryl Takizawa. Um, and in this approach, he designed probes for the Y chromosome um, to target the, the RNA expression um, and looked at PBMC populations of male donors from ages 21 to 50 or from 20 to 51. And he found that there was an increase in uh, loss of the Y chromosome from flowfish facts um, and sorted for the absence of, of signal um, in these populations. We then see that there was about a two to three fold enrichment of loss of Y cell types. Um, and here I'm showing that um, we observe loss of Y in specific cell types and do not observe them in other cell types. The cell types that do show loss of Y are um, monocytes, naive Tregs, uh, T cells, and T Regs. Um, and these, this has previously also been described. Um, and the cell types that, that do not have loss of Y are CD8 naive cells, B, and B cells, and um, dendritic cells. And um, after doing downstream differential gene expression analysis, we find that um, in loss of Y in monocytes, um, could play a role in inflammatory dysregulation where we see an enrichment of TNF alpha signaling by NF kappa beta. Um, we also, um, like I mentioned earlier, show that you can use PerfSeq in different tissue contexts. Um, and, and we do this in two different ways. One was in mouse brain enriching for oligodendrocytes. Um, we, we first associate tissue and um, isolate the nuclei, and we enrich for oligodendrocytes with this highly specific uh, marker, MOP-P. Um, and then for FFPE, we opted to use um, glioblastoma multium, um, multiform uh, tissue and enrich uh, using these markers that have been described um, to or implicated in the path pathogenesis of this cancer type. Um, and we see very robust enrichments um, in, in our populations. Um, and we perform PerfSeq downstream and do 10x um, flex. And we see that there was no appreciable loss of data quality. Um, this is the same plot that I showed earlier, but in a different context where um, after downsizing for publicly available data, we see that there's 
no loss um, or appreciable loss in data quality from our libraries. So we are very excited about this. Um, and we think that this can be very broadly applied. Um, specifically, talking about some of the work in the mouse brain context, uh, we see that there's, um, again, robust enrichments between our mob P positive and mob P negative populations. Um, and when looking further in the mob P positive population, uh, we find that um, we find that there are subclusters that express different um, genes. Um, and interestingly, we, we find a very rare cell population that um, expresses very low levels of, of um, uh, or very specific levels of mob P and uh, has not been described in subcortical um, tissue settings previously. So um, going back to this table that I showed earlier, where um, I described some of the capabilities that we were really interested in applying, uh, we were able to uh, get all of these with our method. Um, and so we're able to enrich based off of arbitrary RNA markers, as I've described, and we do this in different tissue contexts as well. Um, we also do more than one gene uh, marker and, and see that we're able to gate on multiple um, RNA markers. Uh, we also see that um, we don't lose any, we don't compromise on our data quality in this process, and we're able to detect um, as many genes as you would with normal flex. Um, and then finally, we are also able to do this in a high throughput way, and we get um, that would allow us to look at the heterogeneity and make functional inferences about our cells and nuclei. Um, I also want to mention that um, Caleb's website, lab website, has um, all of the information available for this paper. Uh, we have the preprints. Um, we also have complete protocols for PerfSeq on Protocols IO. Um, and all of the data um, and custom code is also accessible from the, the same um, web page. Cool. And with that, I really want to thank um, people that have been instrumental in this work. So I want to thank the South Pathy Lab um, at Stanford and Gladstone that I, I um, learned a lot from and grew a lot uh, from. Um, and I want to thank the LaRoe Lab, which um, I've been interacting with and learning a lot from recently. Um, and uh, finally, I really want to thank SAIL for elevating this work. Um, and they've also been really great to work with and interact with and learn from.